me as well. So welcome to this webinar about the uh, preparing a proposal for the 2025 North Central Region SARE Research and Education Grant Program. So if you are located in one of the upper Midwest states and that, that goes from the Dakotas down to Kansas, across to Ohio, and all the geography in between, you are in the right spot. Um, and I am Beth Nelson. I am the Regional Director for the North Central Region SARE. Um, and I'm joined today, um, Marie Flanagan and Aaron uh, Schneider are helping uh, with some of the logistics for the program. So they are running the tech. If you have problems, you can reach them in the chat. Uh, this is a webinar, which means that you do not have um, the ability to, to unmute and ask questions, but you can enter questions in the chat as we go along. And Erin Schneider is going to be monitoring those. She'll collect those, and we're going to hold those till the end, if that's okay. Uh, ju I'm just hopeful that I might cover some of the information you have questions about as we go through in the program. So... Um, Again, uh, welcome, and I'll just tell you a little bit of what we're going to be um, doing today. Uh, first of all, all of the information that I'm going to cover today, including the slides, are located on our northcentralsare.org website, and you'll see that at the bottom of most of these slides. is um, That's the link to our grants page. We have a section, Apply for a Grant. And if you go to the Research and Education Grant Program, you're going to be able to download the call for proposals. You'll see um, these slides along with notes, plus we'll post a video, uh, we'll post a recording of this presentation as well. So we're just going to kind of run through some of the um, overview about SARE and about North Central SARE pretty quickly. Then I'll go into some specifics about the Research and Education Grant Program. We'll talk, I'll give you a few tips about how to apply, and then we'll gather questions, and I'll want to leave plenty of time for your questions at the end. And I'll ask you to keep the questions a little bit general. I'll also give my contact information at the end. And please feel free to call me to talk about a specific idea or concept uh, if you want to go over something. Um, at the end, after we've answered questions, um, for those of you who have who are familiar with the projects.sare.org application site. You're welcome to leave at that point. For those of you who are new to our application online system, I'll run through a few quick screenshots for you just of how to get into the system and some of the major parts of it. And I will say also that the slide set that we have posted on our website goes through a lot of the step-by-step -step screenshots for the application. So you can always refer to that as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started and say that our research and education grant program is a competitive grant program, and we fund collaborative teams of scientists, farmers, institutions, and educators who are exploring sustainable agriculture through research projects or through education demonstration projects. And this year, the pre-proposals are due Thursday, October 10th at 4 o'clock p.m. Central Daylight Time and the, you will apply through our online application system. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So the USDA uh, Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program is commonly referred to by our acronym SARE, and it is a program of the United States Department of Agriculture. We are a USDA program, not everybody um, is aware of that. We are funded under the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, or NIFA. In the next slide. We provide grants and outreach to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture. And next slide. We are a, a, little, a different kind of a grant program. These are kind of some of the major attributes of the SARE grant program. We are decentralized. I already told you that if you're in the North Central region, this is the, this is the right webinar for you. So uh, we have four different regions and each of the regions is administered by an administrative council that decides the programs and priorities for that region. We are science-based. 
we you will see the pre-proposal and the full proposal. We ask for hypotheses and how you're going to set up your approach and how you'll analyze your data or what type of an education approach you're going to be using. We are grassroots, and that's a big part of the SARE program. That's a lot of what I think makes us a little different from some of the other NIFA grant programs is that we do farmer-driven research, and we do practical problem-solving research. We recognize that basic research is really important to move agriculture forward, but it's not what we fund. So we're looking at problems that you are coming up with solutions for that might be used in the field within three to five years. Um, so, so really very um, applied research is what is funded under this program. We seek to be inclusive. And again, we are a competitive grant program and I'll talk a little bit about the numbers. Um, this is our most competitive grant program in our portfolio. And we are also an outreach program. So we expect that the information that you gather from your research will be shared uh, with, the, with the end users or with your audience, which for us primarily means farmers and ranchers. Uh, next slide. I did say that we also are an outreach program and that um, comes through both the outreach that you do about your project, but also we have a separate arm of SARE that gathers information from all of the research projects and puts them into bulletins or books that are available online. So that's a great thing for you to be able to use as a resource to look up information. Uh, most of the books um, are available uh, to, to download for free. They're available as PDFs or um, the bulletins are all available as PDFs as well, or you can order print copies of those as well. You can order print copies of the books as well for a nominal fee, but that's a, a that resource room is a great place to check out if you get a chance. The next slide. So one of the things that you will be asked to do in any of our SARE grants is to address all three aspects of sustainability. So we're looking for projects that are socially responsible, ecologically sound, and promote economic viability uh, for farmers and ranchers in the long term. And it may be that your research proposal or your education proposal is going to emphasize one of those areas over the others. That's great, we get that. Um, but we want you to be thinking about how it also affects the other aspects. Um, and so you'll be asked to address that in any of our North Central Region or any of our SARE grant proposals. Uh, next slide. I just want to uh, point out that we have pretty recently put together a bulletin about addressing social sustainability because that's an area um, it's certainly when I, I was going through graduate school many years ago uh, was not really emphasized as much as well, how does this how does the work you do affect your community or the farmers or the family on the farm and so that's a little bit harder for us to think about how you might measure those types of things and how you might be impacting those from your project uh, so this is just kind of a short bulletin that guides you through and helps you think through some of that and I, I so we'd like to make uh, you know that that's available to look through. Uh, next slide. You noticed from the beginning when I said our mission is to do innovation for the whole of American agriculture, that that is a huge charge, which that, that means that we fund, uh, we fund topics, just a huge diverse array of topics from sustainable pest and weed management, marketing, water quality, food sovereignty, uh, small ruminants, poultry cattle, cover crops, et cetera, et cetera. So we cover just nearly all aspects of, of agriculture and sustainability. Um, so you can see a lot of the projects that we have funded. I'll talk a little bit more about that in our reporting database and see just kind of how broadly, uh, we cover sustainable agriculture. The next slide. 
So we are the North Central Region. So again, if you are in one of the states or she, or shared geography with one of the states that is in that those gold, that gold designated area on this map, you are in the right spot. In the North Central Region, we offer six different grant programs, and four of those are open right now for applications. Uh, and they basically vary on who is writing the or who is leading the project or who the audience is for the project. So we have ones available to farmers and ranchers. We have this program, which is the research and education grant program. We have a partnership grant program that's a little bit uh, lower of funding, but it also does research and education and it involves an ag professional working with three or more farmers. Um, and that might be something to look into as well. And there is a webinar on that tomorrow at 10 a.m. So if you haven't signed up for that and you're interested in the partnership program, you should do that. Uh, the professional development program trains uh, educators. Uh, uh, so it, we call it our train the trainer program. And that program is available in the spring as is the graduate student program. And that funds an aspect of a graduate student's research. And then we have a youth educator program and that funds youth educators to share um, sustainable ag information with uh, youth and young adults. Next slide. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now, and I'm going to talk specifically about our North Central Region and the Research and Education Grant Program, which is what you all signed up for. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. These are the basics of the program. So our grants are capped at $250,000. Of that amount, 10% can be used for indirect costs. Um, and it is capped at that. Universities sometimes uh, have a higher uh, indirect cost rate than that, but SEER is um, capped at 10%. They can be for up to 36 months, so three years. We do have what we call a long-term funding option, and that is in recognition of the fact that some, some of the sustainable ag that we do takes a long time to just get the experimental approach set up. Uh, maybe you're working on a crop rotation or establishing perennials or agroforestry. Um, so we come up with an option that allows you to get the first cycle of three years of funding um, where you might not get many research results because you're just setting up the program. And then you can come back for the next three years if you're making sufficient progress without having to go through the whole pre-proposal process. Um, those are really, they have really strict criteria. So if you are, that's about all I'm going to say, I'll say a little bit more about it later, but I'm not going to say a lot. I'm going to ask that if you're interested in the long-term funding, you give me a call so we can talk about it. As I've said earlier, these projects can be research or they can be education or demonstration projects, but because we emphasize sharing information, even a research project, does need to have an outreach component to it. Again, the proposals are due on Thursday, October 10th at four o'clock uh, Central Daylight Time. And I told you it's a competitive process. So we invite about 30 to 35 pre-proposals. Last year, we got almost 170 pre-proposals. So that in itself is a pretty tough cut. Uh, if you make the pre-proposal cut and you're invited for a full proposal, um, we fund about half of those. So we fund about 16 or 17 of those. Because we use this pre-proposal process, it means that the funds, you have to go through the pre-proposal, then the proposal. So it's a longer process. So the funds are available mid-fall 2025. We say that you have to plan on a start date of November 1st. Um, so more than a year away from now. And we know that's a long way to plan ahead. Next slide, please. So these pre-proposals are reviewed by our administrative council members in groups that are based loosely on expertise and topic. And they are looking at these pretty generally. Um, our administrative council is made up of a diverse group of um, people from from farmers and ranchers, uh, NGO personnel, state and federal 
personnel, researchers, extension educators with expertise on a variety of topics. Um, and we divide them into groups and they review the pre-proposals and they're looking primarily at relevance to sustainable agriculture in our region. They do look at the methods and approach. They're basically looking to see if they think that you will be successful uh, or if you'll be able to do what you think you're going to do using this approach. And then again, uh, emphasizing this concept of farmer-driven research, we ask for farmer engagement in the research or the education. And that may mean that they're on an advisory committee, uh, you're providing them feedback, or, or they're providing you feedback about your research results each year, maybe saying what they think would be practical for a farmer to do or not to do, or if you're doing an education program, maybe talking about what might resonate with farmers and ranchers, but they should be engaged in the project and that is a part of the scoring. Uh, next slide. So again, to, for a pre-proposal to be successful, it has to show that it is relevant to the North Central region and that it is something um, that is building on or is different from something that has been funded before. It needs to address the three aspects of sustainable agriculture or NCR SARE's three broad-based outcomes, which are looking at economic, social, and environmental sustainability. And it has to involve farmers and ranchers in the project. Uh, next slide, Marie. Um, also has to have clear outcomes and I will say a little bit more about um, specifics about outcomes, because that's sometimes we tend to um, sometimes think of that as the results of an experiment. And the outcomes uh, is more about what the impact of your research will be. So what will happen as a result of you sharing the results of your project or you doing your project? And again, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that um, having that clearly outlined in your pre-proposal is really important. Uh, next slide. We do use an online submission program. It's projects.sare.org. The link is in the call for pre-proposals. And you should download that call for pre-proposals, which is on our North Central SARE website. It goes over a lot of this information, it has a little bit more background, but um, it will contain the same information that we're going over now. We suggest that you prepare this in a Word document or something like that, where you can do word counts and then cut and paste it into the system because we, because this is a pretty short pre-proposal, um, we hope that we're kind of minimizing the time and effort you're putting into it. Um, but but sometimes it's harder to write less than it is to write more. So um, it's it's a good idea to kind of work it out in a word processing package so that you know you're meeting the word limits and then paste it into the system. I will warn you, you might wanna practice, you might wanna do a trial run of that first because we have found that sometimes browsers don't do a great job of cutting and pasting. A specific browser may have problems with doing that. So you might wanna test that out and see if it works first. Next slide. I said I'd say a little bit more about the long-term funding. So there is a spot on the application where you indicate that you are hoping to apply for the long-term funding. And then you're, if you indicate that, then you would include a strong justification why the research requires long-term funding. Um, and how that would work is if you're invited for a full proposal and you're encouraged to seek long-term funding, uh, you would get you would submit the initial three-year cycle with a budget with a work plan for later cycles, and then funding for further cycles are awarded if uh, the project is proceeding as expected. Right. Next slide. So the next thing I'm going to um, suggest you do is, again, go to the Research and Education Grant pro, uh, page on our North Central SARE website. Uh, there is a sample call for proposals. You definitely want to download that and look through that. Um, and then you should also look at past grant projects to see what's been funded before. And I think that's on the 
Um, I guess the next slide is actually um, our applying for a grant page, uh, which has some additional resources uh, that you can use. This is also where you can find information about the other grant programs, if you have an interest in applying for one of those. You can apply for two grant programs at the same time. So sometimes people will apply for both to put in a research and education grant pre-proposal, as well as a partnership grant program that's kind of a scaled down version or one aspect of that. Um, that's not a bad approach because the partnership grant program in the past has been far less competitive than the research and education grant program. Uh, this year, in the past, we haven't had restrictions on the number of pre-proposals a project lead can submit. This year, we are limiting it to, you can only be the principal investigator or the project coordinator on one research and education pre-proposal. Uh, next slide. We also encourage you uh, to contact your SARE state coordinator. So we have um, a small part of uh, a state coordinator's time is bought out, is paid for by SARE um, to help for them to talk with people who are interested in applying for grants. And so if you go to that state programs page and click on your state, you'll find contact the name of your state coordinator as well as their contact information. And I strongly encourage you to talk to them. Many of them have served on our review committees before, so they have a really good idea of what we're looking for in grants. Uh, they will often read through the draft of your pre-proposal and give you comments if you give them sufficient time to do so ahead of the deadline. So uh, definitely you should be contacting your SARE state coordinator and talking about your idea. Next slide. I'm going to just very briefly go through the parts of the project. Um, so there's a cover, what we call the cover part, which has the normal information of title, start and end date, whether your project is focusing on socially disadvantaged or limited resource farmers. Uh, we're asking for a funding request range. This is a change from about five years ago where we no longer ask you to put a budget in your pre-proposal. That has a big advantage of sometimes not needing to then go through your grants office. Um, although you need to check with your grants office because some grant offices do ask you to also put a pre-proposal through. But because we don't ask for a budget, uh, they don't always feel that they have to sign off on that aspect of it. We do ask for you to come up with a range of what you're expecting to ask for. Um, so in $50,000 increments up to $250,000. Uh, we do that just so we can kind of look at uh, what you're proposing to do for the amount of funding you think it will take and, and see if that seems to make sense. Um, but you're, that's all you're required to do. We know you're gonna have to pencil out a budget in order to figure out what that range will be. Uh, but you don't have to submit a formal budget and you are not able to submit a formal budget with a pre-proposal. We do ask you to tell us whether your project is focused primarily on research or primarily on education demonstration, uh, knowing that it will might have a little bit of both. And that's just also so we can kind of look at what's being emphasized in your materials and methods. Again, the long-term funding option is something you can consider uh, applying for. We ask for a systems category and commodity category. You can only choose one. I know sometimes that causes people um, some heartburn trying to figure out where, what category their project fits in. We just use that for sorting into groups to some extent, but mostly it's just for our own data collection to know what topics we're getting proposals uh, in on. And then of course, you're, uh, you'll need to supply your institutional information. Next slide. Uh, again, we do have the question about, will your proposed research or outreach primarily focus on historically underserved farmers and ranchers? And that has a specific USDA definition that again is listed in the call for 
decree proposals. So you should look at that. And we ask you not just to say uh, whether you are going to be focused on that audience, but how you're focusing specifically and whether you already have ties to those communities. So you don't have a lot of space to do that, but we just want a little bit more information about that. It is not scored. And I will say that it's just kind of taken into consideration, especially if a project is kind of on the bubble of the decision that might be something taken into consideration, but it is not scored by our reviewers. Uh, next slide. And this is um, the part about looking at the impact of your project and, and what how do you think your outcomes are going to align with NCR SARE's proposed outcomes, which again, address um, economic viability, environmental quality, and then quality of life of, of farmers and ranchers or their communities. You're gonna have a project summary. You're gonna have a section for those objectives and outcomes. You're going to be talking about um, the relevance to sustainable agriculture in our region, the method and approach. Um, the next slide. And again, I, I guess I should say too, for the method and approach that you are uh, not giving us details at this point, that will really come in a full proposal. You're just giving us enough information for them to judge whether they think you can accomplish your objectives or your outcome using that approach and those methods. For the section on relevance and background, uh, we encourage you to look at our SARE grant management system. Again, projects.sare.org is the same portal that you apply in, but within that portal is also where we collect all the reports from all the projects. I think we're 7,000 plus projects nationally funded uh, since this program began in 1988. And you can look up past their projects and uh, let us let the reviewers know um, how your work differs from or builds on past projects. And we do understand that sometimes something might have been done in the western part of the region, but you have very different weather patterns in the eastern part of our region. And so that's the reason to do this project in Michigan um, or in Ohio. Or it may be that that project was done in 2010 and weather patterns have changed tremendously and there are other issues to be taken into consideration now. It just helps in the justification for the project if you can show that you know some of the work that's been recently funded and how your work differs from that or is building on that. It's also just a terrific resource for information. So I encourage you to go into that search projects um, aspect of that portal. Next slide. Again, I just want to say a little bit about outcomes because this sometimes is not how we think about our research projects. So we'll start with the education project. So let's say you are proposing to do post-harvest handling workshops. We talk about having learning outcomes and action outcomes. So the learning outcomes, that's pretty self-explanatory. It means the people who are listening to your presentation are gonna learn something. So in this project, you're gonna do workshops and the farmers are gonna learn post-harvest handling um, and packing techniques for sales to institutions. So then the action outcome for that would be that they'll use those new techniques, they'll impl implement new practices and they will increase their sales to institutions. In an education project, you would probably be able to track those action come outcomes because you're going to, you might be doing that workshop in the first or the second year and you can go back to those participants a year later and ask them if they've changed their practices. Um, for a research project, go to the next slide. For a research project, you're actually gathering data and getting research results for two or three years, and then you're presenting that information to your intended audience. So you may not be able to track action com outcomes for a research project because there just may not be time enough in a three-year project for you to do that. So the example I give here is you have a research project where you're 
looking at the influence of landscape diversity on vegetable crop pollinator population. So you would collect data on this, set up your experiment, collect data on this for two or three years, present seminars or present at field days, and farmers are going to learn how diverse landscape influences the number and type of pollinators. And you could do surveys to see if they've learned um, from the knowledge you shared from your results. But you will probably not be able to track the action outcomes, which would be maybe that farmers will use biodiverse plantings to increase pollinator population. So reviewers are aware of that. They know that for a research project, those action outcomes might not be forthcoming, but you can state that, that that's what you hope will happen, but it will not be within the time frame of the project. Uh, next. Next slide. So I think these, these are the last three sections that are in the pre-proposal body. We talk about um, who are the members of your team, and this is really pretty short, just kind of who are they? What's their expertise? Um, then farmer rancher involvement, and that's a that's a critical part of this. Is how will farmers and ranchers be involved in the research or in the education, in the outreach, uh, in helping to come up with the idea for the project? Or um, maybe you've gotten the idea for the project from surveys that you've done at field days or something like that. So that information should be shared in this section. And then a statement regarding resubmitted ideas. As I, it's a very competitive grant program, but we do give you feedback on the pre-proposal if you're not invited. If you think some of that information made sense and you use that and to submit a new pre-proposal this year, um, that's a section where you can say how you address previous reviewers' comments. And that can be a really powerful section. So if you are reapplying, um, you should definitely use that extra space to show how you have addressed reviewers' concerns from your previous application. And I think we are almost at the end of this part of the presentation. So the next slide is the timeline. So again, October 10th, 2024 is when the pre-proposals are due online um, by four o'clock PM Central Daylight Time. You will be notified in February of 2025 whether you're invited to submit a full proposal or not. And you do get review comments when you receive that notification. And so you can use those in a full to improve your full proposal, or you could use those if you're not invited for a full proposal to resubmit next year. Uh, the full proposals are usually due in April, and the Review Committee makes funding recommendations to the Administrative Council in July, and the award offers are sent in August. Budgets get reviewed, contracts finalized uh, in August and September, and November 1st is the earliest that you can begin your project. So again, it's a pretty long timeline because we use the pre-proposal process, but the the benefit of that is the pre-proposal is fairly short, so it gives you a chance to pitch the concept, see if the administrative council members are, are willing to invite that for a full proposal, and then spend a lot more time and effort preparing that full proposal if you're invited. We do uh, request annual reporting, uh, but you wouldn't have a report due for several years from now uh, if you were funded. And then the final report is due 60 days after the project ends. And I think that's the last slide, except for my contact information. So um, you can go ahead and put that up, Marie. Um, please feel free to either call me or to set up a time to talk. Um, that can work pretty well or email me. Sometimes it's easier for me to respond to emails because I can do that early or late, uh, maybe where I might not return a phone call uh, if it's not during office hours. Um, so please contact me if you have questions, but also get in touch with your state coordinator. And uh, at this point, I think I'm going to take questions. So I'm going to have Aaron just kind of uh, read me the ones that have come in. And then um, 
again, for those of you who haven't been in the projects.sera.org application system, if you want to stick around for just a few minutes, we'll show you a few screenshots after we're done answering most of the questions. Um, and you can kind of see how the system works. So Aaron, I'm gonna let you go ahead and, and scroll through the through any questions that have come in. Is Aaron muted, Marie? Yes. <laughs> I just unmuted you, Aaron. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks. I was like, hi. No, I am here. And I'm I yelling. Like, I'm yelling. Can't you hear me? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I, um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat on my end. Um, um quite a few questions got posted in the Q and A section. Do you have access to that, Aaron? I have access to that. I do not have access to that. I all I'm seeing in the chat is like some links to um, the open call for proposals and et cetera. But um, Maria, are you able to either yes. give me permission or share what the questions are? Uh, Beth, do you want me to read the questions to you? If you have them access to them, you can read I, them. I've got access, so I'll read them. So um, this first question is. Um, yeah, so the terminology is problematic about socially disadvantaged or limited resources. So farmers don't like to classify themselves in those categories. So are there resources or educational materials from Sarah that we could review to try to reach those farmers? You know, I know we have a we had a publication on limited resource farmers um, from years ago, and we updated that. Um, Marie, can I ask you, Marie works in, is our communication specialist and she works with Sarah Outreach. And we did just put a publication together about resilience. Was Did that also deal with, with farmers without trying to use those labels? We, we use those labels because those are USDA definitions. So the limited resource is a specific dollar amount that most farmers that we work with in our program actually qualify as, but but I take your point that this that it is a problem to use that terminology. Marie, is there a publication that um, we could refer them to? Um, well, the social, the resilient farmer, ranchers and communities, social sustainability and um, agriculture publication. I think that's the one. Can can you put that one in the chat? Yeah. So thank you for that question. I um we we recognize that as we put that in there. Um but it is one of the best ways we feel to make sure we're reaching audiences that we haven't reached before. Um and we we that's why we talk about historically underserved. Um, because that's really what we're trying to do is do a better job of serving farmers and ranchers that have not gotten uh, the lion's share of USDA attention in the past. And we're trying to do be better about that. I'm gonna, so Aaron is, uh, Marie's going to put that in the chat and I'm going to move on to the question from uh, that I'd like more detail on the extent to which farmer partners need to involve. Um, they're not analyzing results. They might be um, providing research material, um, but they should be they should be involved in some of the discussions about the research. I, and that's really more it talking about like this is what we intend to do and is that practical for farmers? Um, we have found that researchers often find that it, it surprises them, um, sometimes the input that they get from farmers that they really Im feel improves the way that they design a study. And so that's the point of that is, again, trying to make these results really practical for farmers to use. Uh, and I would welcome you if you want to talk to me more about that. Um, I'm happy to talk about your specific ideas about that. If We can set up a time to talk about that. 
Uh, the total amount for long-term funding would be uh, if you can apply for up to three cycles, if that's what you write it for, at 250 each. So that could potentially be nine years at 750,000. But you have you do have to write a new work plan for each three-year project because that's how our funding comes forward. So you don't you aren't allotted that funding all at once. At most, you have a budget for two hundred fifty thousand for three years, and you just have three subsequent funding cycles. Uh, it, uh, another question is about geographic distribution of farmers and other stakeholders. There really isn't an ideal geographic distribution. We realize that our grant um, programs are not as large as some NIFA programs. I know a lot of NIFA programs. Uh, score higher if you have multi-state. We don't insist on that, uh, but we do are looking for impact uh, across the North Central region. So it is helpful if you are looking at um, something that could potentially be shared across the rest of the region um, if, if you have a geographic distribution that helps that. But Honestly, this grant program at 250,000, you could not have farmers all over the North Central region. So that is really not weighed very strongly. Uh, and the final question is how do you, or not the final, but the final in this one is how do you decide where our project is weighted toward education or research? And that's not, that's you self deciding. And um, you would just think of if you're doing, more research focus, you're collecting data from an ex experiment that you're setting up. It's probably a research focused project, even though you're sharing the information. Um, if you're doing more workshops or trainings or developing curriculum for uh, farmer trainings, then it's probably more education focused. But again, that's something you're welcome to email me about with your specific idea, and I can help you think that through. Does an education-focused project still need to have some research element to it? No, it does not. So a research project has to have outreach. Um, so it has to be extending the results of the information, but an education-focused project does not have to have research associated with it. Um, are there preferred methods of education or research? Um, does the proposal need to have those listed. So methods of education, I, I think it is useful if you have an education focused project to say how, how you're planning to share that information. And especially, you know, researchers are looking, uh, sorry, reviewers are looking at uh, like, are you are you having interactive sessions? You know, what, what types of things are you doing? Are you you know, are you just printing educational print material? Are you, do you have some kind of an interactive aspect to it? Uh, for methods of research, I think they are looking for just what's, what's appropriate for the problem. Um, so you do have to have some of the details listed. They will look for things like, I know sometimes reviewers have commented, well, they have, you know, how big are these plots going to be? Because if they've got little, you know, five by 10, that's not going to do it for this project or something like that. So they do want to know that you, you know, are going to have a control for an experimental approach. Um, they might want to know a little bit about the design. You don't have to have your layout figured exactly, but what are your treatments? Those type of basic things are the kinds of things they are looking for. And uh, how often are these grants open? Yes, annually. And it's for about the past 10 years almost, I think, it's been about the same timeline. So we have four grant programs that generally are open for application in the fall. And then we have two grant programs that are open for application in the spring. Um, larger, okay, I'm part of a larger working group. We're mostly in the NCR region, but we do have a member in the Northeast and one in the Southern region. We're, can we include them as collaborators in an NCR proposal? Yes, you can. And But I will caution you, if you are from another region, um, 
you need to check with your region about whether that's true. The North Central region does allow that if the information that you're or the work that you're doing applies primarily to the northern region, to the, sorry, to the North Central region. And then we do allow you to let some of the funding go to collaborators who are outside of the region. Um, but if the, primarily the work is outside of the region, then we would hope that you, they would apply from that region, but some of the other regions do not let funding go outside of their region. So you need to check about that. And I think in this case where most of your members are from the North Central region, it, it wouldn't be an issue. Once in a while we have an R&E project where maybe just, you know, there are two collaborators and one of them is outside of the region. And those can be scrutinized a little bit more by reviewers who wonder if we don't have someone who could have filled that role or filled that um, area of expertise from within our region. So just if you do have members outside the region, you just justify why, why they are included in the proposal. If someone plans to apply uh, to two or more different grant options from the NCR region grants, is that okay? Yes, it is. Um, so what will happen is if you, so I, the example I gave was applying, putting in a R&E pre-proposal and maybe putting in a partnership grant as well. So you will find out about those, whether you're successful in both of those grant programs about the same time, which is in February. And so at that point, you could decide to, you know, go forward with the research and education and not do the grant, the partnership grant program, or you could do the partnership grant program, making sure that the R&E one now does not overlap with any of the tasks that you're doing on your partnership grant. So also the same thing's true for the farmer rancher grant. If you're applying for a farmer rancher grant, you can apply to that program and to another grant program as well. Uh, and as I said, the rule about limiting applications is a new one in the research and education pre-proposal. We want you to only submit one pre-proposal per PI or principal investigator. We expect to have specific farms and ranches that we plan to involve before submitting the application. You are, and part of that is because um, sometimes it's not, it's not as easy to recruit farmers and ranchers um, to do some of this research work as you might think, especially if you don't have relationships already. So you don't have to have them all lined up. You don't have to, at this point, have letters of, in fact, you can't have letters of, of support or participation from them. You do have to have that at the full proposal level, um, but you should be able to list at least some names of farmers who are going to be participating. And um, and if you can't list them, you should have a reason you need to justify why you can't. And I think we do explain that a little bit more in the call for proposals as well. Uh, who can apply for a research and education grant? Can a postdoc apply? So SARE says a postdoc can apply. Your institution may dictate whether you can be the lead uh, investigator on a funded grant. So you need to check with your institution. If you have gone through the, what is it, RCR, Responsible Conduct of Research Training, often postdocs can apply for grants. So check with your institution, uh, but yes, it's okay for a postdoc to be the lead on an application from SARE's standpoint. That's that's the last question I have in the Q&A. Um, sure, would you like me to go through the chat questions, Beth? That'd be super. Yeah, be glad to. Um, we did have one question asking for the link for tomorrow's partnership webinar in the chat. So I just wanted everyone to know that that is in the chat, um, the information about the partnership webinar. So please scroll down and take a look at that and register and join us tomorrow if you're interested. Um, and then moving on, the a question came in that I'm just making sure they didn't double post it. We're good. Um, are previous grantees more likely to be funded for a new proposal or conversely, are new applicants prioritized? 
there is no um we we don't have any rules or even any guidelines about that so i would say that reviewers look at each of these based on the merits of the proposed work by itself so um yeah there's certainly no scoring for that i'm trying to remember if even in review discussions how often that comes up maybe if if there is a program that has received um numerous grants um they might at least look, reviewers might at least look that up and say, well, you know, gee, they've gotten five grants in the last seven years. Or, you know, do they, you know, is this really something new and different? But otherwise, I, I don't think there's really a preference um, for whether they're new grantees or, or um, whether it's someone who's been successful in the past. The next question is, how many long-term proposals are you anticipating to award okay so this is where i said please uh call me about this because we have awarded one in the past four years um, the criteria for these the one that is kind of the sticking point is um, the reviewers who review for the long-term funding option at the full proposal level are looking at whether you really can get no information uh, that is reportable or could show success of the program within those first three years. So it's really something that cannot be an independent project because we know any project you do that's successful is going to lead to more questions and to will could have a follow-up grant. So this really isn't intended for that. It really is for things that take long enough to set up that you're really not able to collect data until maybe a second cycle. So uh, they have been pretty stringent about uh, uh, allowing uh, long-term funding. We funded one and we usually only invite one or two a year. They do look at the pre-proposal, they say whether they think it fits. And at the pre-proposal level, if you apply under the long-term option and they say this, we think you, can, you could submit this as a short-term proposal, um, they'll tell you that, and you might be invited to apply as a short-term proposal. Um, if you still choose to submit as a long-term proposal, it will either be funded as long-term or not at all um, at the full proposal level. I know that's a little confusing. So again, call me if you have questions. Next question is, would you be able to explain more what the restrictions on the funding itself can be used for? Can it be, can it pay for staff slash infrastructure upgrades? So it can definitely pay for staff for the project. A question that sometimes come up, comes up, especially if you're hiring, um, ec, you know, several staff members are what will happen when you when the grant runs out? Um, and maybe if they're just for the purpose of that grant program, that's fine. It certainly can be used for personnel, and that includes hiring new personnel. Um, infrastructure is tricky. We cannot pay for permanent infrastructure. So you can't retrofill buildings. You can't um, put in anything permanent, but it can pay for things that are technically mobile. So there are some pieces of equipment that are under $5,000 that um, technically are movable. And so those kinds of things we can fund. Um, but yeah, retrofitting buildings or building buildings or building permanent structures um, is not allowed under this funding. Next question is, what is expected of producers participating in a study for outreach? So, so I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're, so they're participating in maybe the research or the education, and then they're going to participate in the outreach component of the project. I would say that, again, that might be at a field day. If you're doing a project and they you did part of your research project was an on-farm project, 
uh, you might hold a field day at that farmer's um, project and just have him talk about the research and what his experience was in cooperating uh, on this project. There, uh, someone, I think you asked earlier, are they going to be, you know, analyzing data and that kind of stuff? No, and they don't have to be presenting, you know, the posters at a field day, or they can do what they feel comfortable doing. Um, they might be on a panel if you're presenting at, uh, especially one of the farmer organization uh, winter conferences, they might be on a panel talking about the results that they saw on their farm or their work with the researcher. That can be a really effective way to use producers in outreach. Um, someone had asked for the list of state coordinators. So I went ahead and put that in the chat. And once again, please do contact the state coordinator in your state. They are a fantastic resource and um, can really help you as you work through coming up with a proposal idea. Um, the next question is, does match, does match funding slash leveraged funds from other sources increase the ranking for a proposal? Um, no. And in fact, we don't require, that's a big advantage of SARE grants is we don't require match funding. Uh, and we don't want to see it in a budget. Again, for the RNA pre-proposals, you're not submitting a budget anyway, but we don't uh, want to see um, any match funding. You can mention it um, in your thing, say we have funding from, from this thing, but we uh, you know, need to do the outreach part of it or something. We want to do the workshops based on you know, the work that we're doing in this other funding. So that can be a helpful part of the background to say that you've been funded, you have partial funding to do part of this project, but you want to do more with, with what you're going to propose in this proposal. But, and so in that, in that way, maybe it could influence, but it is not a part of the scoring. Um, and we ask that you not include matching funds in your budget at a full proposal level. Hey, Marie, I'm seeing in the chat a question just above that that says um, one of the initial slides describes the types of funding. So the r &E versus the grant, uh, the partnership yeah. program. I thought we'd go back to that after we answer the other questions. Perfect. Okay. Um, there's one more in the Q&A. Can farmers rent and ranchers be only involved in outreach activities for research proposal? Yes, it, if that's the most effective way to use them, they can be. Again, in this competitive grant program, um, a, a project that has them more engaged throughout the project might fare a little better, but that certainly is um, one way to have them involved in the, in the project. Okay, and then I think we've answered all the questions. So then the request was to um, go back to that slide. Let's see. Oops, sorry, it's way at the beginning. So I, do you think it was the one with the with the map? Oh, I because I don't think we we didn't talk about all the different ones. We just showed what the list of them was. Okay, so the, re and again, there's a partnership uh, webinar tomorrow that'll go through this more thoroughly. So um, the research and education is kind of the one that's uh, wide open. So it, but the audience, um, you're tr primarily tackling problems um, that will, so you're primarily solving problems that farmers or ranchers have uh, in their fields. So either doing research and education, research on those or education and or a demonstration. So um, that could be that long list of topics to be grazing. It could be cover crops. It could be marketing. Um, but it's just kind of more of a, a basic proposal. Um, a lot of them come from institutions, either no, uh, nonprofits or from academic institutions or colleges, um, but they they can come from individuals as well. 
the partnership one is a program that we set up about, it's probably been seven years or so ago now, that's kind of a cross between the Farmer Rancher Grant Program, which the Farmer Rancher Grant Program, those are written by farmers and ranchers to solve a problem on their farmer and ranch. And they do share that information, but they're solving a problem on their farmer ranch. And they have to be written by a farmer. Um, the partnership one was kind of designed to be a little bit of a hybrid between the farmer rancher and the research and education one. So uh, the idea comes from like, if you're an extension educator and you're presenting and you have a group of farmers come, come up and say, you know, we've been hearing a lot about grazing cover crops and how that's really great. We, we're just wondering if there's any research on that in our region or what you know about that and if the ag educator or the extension educator is willing to serve as a lead on a partnership grant program, he could say, well, you know what, we could do that. We could test that out on your fields. If you want to give it a shot, we'll put this partnership grant together. So it's, the idea is that maybe the farmers or ranchers don't want to write a grant. They don't want to have to manage a grant, but they'd like to do the research. They'd like to see it happen. And the ag professional um, who is leading the project, and, and we define ag professional pretty broadly. It could be a farmer or a rancher who's ag acting as the ag professional. They just, if they are leading the project, they need to have an additional three farmers and ranchers working with them. But it could be personnel from a, a nonprofit. Um, it might be, um, you know, a nonprofit farm that is working with three different um, farmers or something like that that want to research a specific project. So that's kind of what the partnership grant program is. I think, uh, again, I would in, please register for the webinar tomorrow. Uh, Betsy will go over some of the same basic information, but actually skips over a little bit more of that. We'll go more into the nuts and bolts of the partnership grant program tomorrow uh, morning. So please um, sign up for that if you're um, if you're interested. But there's one more question in the chat. Are there any urban farmer SARE contacts? We do not have a specific urban farmer SARE contacts. Tech. That's an interesting question. We search some of our state coordinators are really good um, and know a lot about urban farming. So um, I would invite you to give me, uh, to email me and ask me about your area, or there may be a, a state coordinator in another uh, state who focuses on urban ag and, and might be willing uh, to help you with your project. So please, um, yeah, email me and maybe we can talk about that and see if you're close to one of the state coordinators who does a lot of work in urban farming. I will say that actually a number of them have are a lot more familiar with urban farming than any of us were 10 or 15 years ago. It's certainly been something that we have funded a number of projects in, especially in the Farmer Rancher Grant Program, but also in the Partnership and the Research and Education Grant Program. So Beth, I believe we've answered all the questions in the Q&A and the chat. Okay, we've worn everybody out. So so again, for those of you who are either are confident you can work your way through a grant application portal just fine on your own or follow the screenshots that are in the in the slide deck that are posted on our website. Um, you know, you are free to go. Um, and uh, just have, I think, a few like five or so screenshots for those of you who want to stick around and see how to get into the online portal. Um, that we'll run through really quickly. So thank you again for taking the time to attend today. And I hope we see proposals from you. Um, and just as a reminder, the link of, of the recording of this webinar, the link for this webinar will be posted on the research and education grant page along with the call for proposals. Um, and we will post that within, I would say 24 hours, it'll be available. Sounds great. And again, thank you, Marie and Aaron, for helping um, to to oversee the webinar. So it makes things and advancing the slides makes things go a little bit more smoothly for me. So thank you again.
Beth, a, a new resource too that we have on um, kind of like how to access and um, create an application on projectsoutsider.org. There are some videos on how to apply to that you can use as a resource. Yeah, and some of those were developed to be a little bit more specifically for the farmer rancher grant program, but some of them are more general um, and actually get you into the system just fine like this for how to set up an account and those types of things as well. So yeah, we should we should remember to add those into the chat and maybe add that into the add that into our presentations. Um, thanks for that suggestion, Aaron. All right, so for those of you who are still here, this is, uh, so projects.sare.org is the portal to go into. If you haven't been in, um, you'll need to either, if you've been in before, you'll log in or you go to that create an account. And that's just gonna ask you for some preliminary information, primarily your email address and your first and last name. Um, it also does ask for address and some other things that are required or not required. We do require demographic information that is not tied to any proposal at all. Again, it's just tied to our efforts to try to do a better job of reaching uh, people who are historically underserved. And so we just... Um, you are required to answer the demographic questions. There is an option that says um, prefer not to answer for each of the questions. Um, and if that's your choice, uh, you can mark that as well. But you knew, do need to complete it to set up your account. So you're going to set up your account, uh, and then you will move on to um, the next step. This is, um, this is setting up your account. So again, you have to enter your email, your username, uh, your first and your last name, um, and a few more things, your address, and then you do have to answer the demographic questions. I know this is a not very legible, but at least at you, it's small print on your screen, but at least you will be able to recognize it when you see it pop up in the system. So you complete that, and then you, uh, you register at the bottom, you click on register, and then you have your account, and then you can, will be able to log in. You'll set a password and you'll be able to log in. And then the next thing you'll do is choose which grant to apply for. So you're gonna, well, you so you'll log in and now it's gonna say you wanna start a new grant proposal. And it, when you come back, so obviously you don't have to complete this all at once, you can start it and come back. So when you come back, you click on manage my grant proposal, which will give you a list of the ones that you've started. And then you will be able to go to the one that you've started and work on that one. But for now, you're gonna be starting a new grant proposal. So you click on that. You wanna make sure you choose the North Central region and the correct grant program. So, and again, we list the states uh, and the, or the geography within the, that share uh, the sh yeah, the shared geography within those states um, for the North Central region. And then you also want to choose the correct grant program. So you would choose the North Central pre-proposal research and education pre-proposal program. Again, you'll see that there are four grant programs open and you could also, it's the same thing you'll do to choose the partnership one. Uh, and you would choose that and then it will open up the portal for the application and go through those, um, the cover page and the body. I, I think, is, is there one more slide? I can't remember how many slides we have in here. Yeah, so this is then, this is you beginning your proposal. So you type in the title, a very short description, and then you see here down at the bottom, um, that's the cover and when you, the cover page, and that's going to have your title, your end dates, those things. So you go through that. Um, below that, you would see um, the body of the proposal. And so you just go through all of those pieces. Uh, a word of caution, I should have said this during the main webinar, so you guys are getting an extra tip. Um, this program does not save as you type. You have to hit the save button. So 
I always say save frequently because if you get a phone call or if you get called away from the computer and you've just spent, you know, 15 minutes crafting a paragraph, this is also another reason that it's good to cut and paste from a, a, a word um, processing program. Um, if you spend a lot of time crafting something in there and then you get called away and you come back and you didn't save it, it will not be there when you come back in. So save frequently. Uh, is there one more slide? No. There is not. So you just have to imagine the rest of it or actually go into the portal, see what's there. And again, you are welcome to contact me. You can contact the NCR SEER office. Erin, uh, I think, is also listed as a contact in the call for proposals and can be helpful on any of the grant programs. Um, and so she can help you with the online system, too, if you have any issues with that. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, let you all go. And thank you again for your time attending. And we look forward to receiving pre-proposals from you or proposals in the other grant programs and hope to see some of you maybe tomorrow on the partnership grant uh, webinar.